So this morning we're going to be reading out of Luke chapter uh, 15, and we're going to start in verse 11. <laughs> Excuse me, just clearing my throat here. I, uh, I, want, I titled this morning's message, Home is Where the Heart Is. Amen. And But before we get started, I wanted to just ask a question. Whoever's watching, whoever's present this morning, before we read the passage today, I would ask this question. Who are we speaking to this morning? The reason I'm asking is because, listen, the saved and the unsaved might have a differing understanding of what we're going to try to talk about. Why? Because the unsaved... Right? There isn't a strong reminding voice that keeps reminding you that you're not where you're supposed to be. But if you're saved, if you've truly been born again. In other words, what does it mean to be born again, preacher? I don't know if I understand. I've heard people say it, but I don't know if I understand. Well, listen, according to the biblical text, if let me just explain it like this. Somebody somewhere would have had to have told you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or you heard, I don't even think you got to hear a whole complete presentation. You could have been driving down the road, going somewhere, and some church billboard said, Jesus saves. And you might have even started to ponder in your mind as the Holy Spirit began to speak to your heart. What does that mean, Jesus saves? And, and the Holy Spirit may have, would have possibly reciprocated and spoken to your heart and would have told you this. He would have said, he saves you from sin. Because you're not right. And, and, and I sent Jesus to save you. So however you heard that gospel message, you heard it if you're saved. And when you heard it, you believed it. You didn't just believe it here, but you believed it here in your core, in your inner being. And what you did was you received Jesus unto yourself. And you believe, yes, this is what I need. Even if you didn't understand it completely. You believe, yes, this is what I need. I need Jesus. And Jesus, won't you come into my heart and won't you forgive me? And if that happened, then you know it happened. Because the word of God says you were sealed with the spirit of God. And anybody that's ever been born again, I'm telling you right now, they can attest. I'm not talking about just praying a prayer in vacation Bible school when you were 10 years old. That might have been real. If you prayed a prayer in vacation Bible school when you were 10 years old and, it, and you got saved, then you know what I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit came to live in your heart and your life has never been the same. And that's what I'm talking about. If you're saved, you're going to have a different feeling about this message that I'm going to preach. But I'm trying to prepare you if you're unsaved to understand what I'm trying to talk about this morning. Because really what I'm talking about this morning is for the believer. I'm talking to the believer this morning. And if you're a believer and you've been saved and you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, there's a strong reminding voice that never leaves you. Oh, he's always there and he's pleading and he's speaking and he's con and he's talking to you and he's saying, won't you come back? Won't you turn around? Won't you come back to the place? Don't you know that home is where the heart is? That voice keeps saying, this isn't making you happy. See, the Holy Spirit lives in your heart if you're a believer. And if you're traveling to certain places, well, no, let's say it like this. If you're running from God's will, if you're running from God's will, then the Holy Spirit in you is saying, this isn't home why are you here? This isn't home. Why are you here? Let's read Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. I mean, just to explain, what does that even mean, fain? That's where, I know I've said this before in church. I've taught on this before many times. I mean, this is where we get the word fiend. It's a literal word. The word fain there means to have a desire for something, an overwhelming compulsion and desire for something that really, and most of the times, is not anything that you would want to have a desire for, and it's just going to destroy you. 
But anyway, he would he was feigning or feigning to have his belly filled with the with the pig food. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, that, you know, that really was sticking out to me this morning. When he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no more worthy to be called your son and make me as one of your hired servants. You know, I didn't put this in my message, but I'm thinking, you know, when you read this particular little verse, this first part of verse 19, and am no worthy to be called your son. I've sinned against heaven. First of all, that is in my message. But listen, he comes to a place of humility. All right. And before you, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned before you, oh God. And I am no more worthy to be called your son. I'm telling you right now, there's some teachings in the modern church that still live on today that would probably take issue with that how how dare you speak that over yourself that you're no longer worthy to be called the son of the living god you are the righteousness of god you are the child of god that's what the word of god says listen to me when you come to a place of humility and you realize that you have transgressed god and you realize you have gone against god's will you're humbled in your heart and you realize lord i am unworthy but you are so good that you have made a way to make me worthy and that's what's happening in this young man's heart right here. I'm willing to be a servant, Lord. I know that I was born a son, but I'm willing to be a servant. You know, that's the truth right there. That's the gospel. When you get born again, you become a co-heir with Christ Jesus. There's an eternal reward awaiting you in heaven. And at the same time, the humble of heart, when the Holy Spirit enters into your heart and grabs a hold of you, he will speak to you and he will tell you that you are called to be a servant. The Lord said, Jesus himself said, I have no longer called you servants, but I call you friends because a servant doesn't know what his master's going to do. But at the same time, I'm telling you, when you're lined up with the will of God, the Holy Spirit in your heart will, will bring you to a place of submission and he will give you the heart of the Apostle Paul who said, I am a do loss of Jesus Christ, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's something that's going on in there. Yes, you're a son, you're a co-heir, and that's how God sees you. But the Holy Spirit in you, working in you, says, you know what, I need to lower myself. Because Jesus lowered himself. The same spirit that rose him from the dead now lives in you. He will quicken your mortal body. He will bring your spirit man to life. And he will begin to give you revelation of the word of God. And in that revelation you will realize. With revelation you will realize. That you are to be a servant. That you are to be humble. To walk humbly before the Lord. He says in verse 20, he arose and he came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And, you know, I just want to stop right now because I got to tell you that that's how good God is. And that no matter what else you get out of this message, I feel like the Lord would say that you need to tell my people that I love, that I sent my son to purchase their salvation, all because I want to have a relationship with them, that I am this good. That no matter how far they've run, no matter how bad they've done, no matter how much they've tried to separate themselves from me, I love them. And I desire to receive them back unto myself. And if they would just come to me, and, and be willing to surrender to me and humble themselves before me. They would fill my open arms embracing them. Father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. Put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring here the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, your brother is come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, 
because he has received him safe and sound. And he, talking about the brother, was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and entreated him or spoke to him and said, and he answering said to his father, lo, or look, these many years have I served thee. Neither did I transgress at any time your commandment. And yet you never gave me a kid. That's a, that's a baby goat. That I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, your son was come, which has devoured your living with harlots. And, has ki you, and you have killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, son, you are ever with me. And all that I have is yours. It was meat or it was a good thing that we should make merry and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Father, in the name of Jesus, once again, we just invite you into this place and pray that you would just simply use me as a vessel, Lord, and that you would use me as a mouthpiece and that you would speak forth your truth out of your word, Lord God, and that you would ignite it with the power of your Holy Spirit and that you would drive it deep down inside the hearts of your people, Lord God, that you would flip on the switch of revelation and allow us to see what you desire for us to see out of your word in Jesus' name. You know, it seems to me that in life that we're oftentimes plagued, or at least this is something that I have come to a realization of and a revelation of in my own life with the mindset or the feeling that there is something else on the horizon that's going to bring happiness and fulfillment to our hearts other than our walk with Jesus. Sometimes we think these things. If I was married like everyone else, I would be happy. If I had another child, that would do it. A better job, a better car, a better house. And I can remember for me personally, I was actually having a conversation with Robert and I remembered this, that after I was married, I had had children, I was a nurse practitioner, I would still feel unfulfilled. I was going to church, I was involved in the church more than most people. But I still felt unfulfilled, still not completely satisfied. It really, it wasn't anybody else's fault. I just felt like there was something else that was missing. Have you ever been there before? I know you have because we've all been there. And I was going to church, like I said, and, <clears throat> but there was still something missing. And I can remember at that time in my life, in this conversation I was having, that I used to get this nursing journal. It was a quarterly nursing journal. And I would always flip to the back. I didn't really want to read a lot of the articles. I didn't want to take all that time. I flipped to the back and they had this listing of jobs in different states. And I remember I would focus on the state of Florida because I love the beach. And then I'd focus on Colorado. For some reason, the mountains were intriguing to me. I can't snow ski. I've never snow skied. I think I could probably snowboard. But my point is I've never done it, so I don't even know. But for some reason, in my mind, I was thinking, man, if I could just get me a job in the mountains or if I could get me a job on the beach, I'm just trying to tell you, for me personally, now I realize now how ridiculous this was. But in my mind, I literally thought that was the missing piece to the puzzle. Even after I was a Christian, even after I was going to church, even after I was involved in church, even after I now had a degree as a nurse, a nurse practitioner, all these things moving seemingly in the right direction. I now need something else. I need to end up on the white sands and the blue waters of the beach in Florida. And this is finally going to bring me happiness and fulfillment. Now I realize now that how long would have that lasted? Oh, don't get me wrong. I like the Gulf breeze. I like the feel of the ocean spray upon my face. But how long was that going to last before I was right back to the same place of unfulfillment and not, not being happy? Amen. You know? So then all of a sudden, Jesus. Now listen. Once again, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I was already saved. I was already involved in the church. But what I realize now is, is that while he was my savior, he wasn't really the Lord of my life. He wasn't the king of my heart. I didn't even realize it at the time, but I was deluded and I was deceived and believed that I was my own king living in my own kingdom. In other words, it's okay for me to try at all costs to pursue my own happiness. 
And that's why I prefaced this morning's message with, who am I speaking to this morning? Because if I'm speaking to a believer, that means the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. And every time the believer that has the Holy Spirit living in his heart is moving away from home, the Holy Spirit is saying, this ain't where we belong. I'm with you now on this journey. And you're journeying, listen to me, the journey of God's will for your life might put you in the jungles of Africa. And if you are in the jungles of Africa and you're supposed to be there, the Holy Spirit in the midst of your heart is going to be saying, hallelujah, we're home. We're right where we need to be. But listen to me, you could be three blocks down the road from where you're supposed to be living physically, but outside of the Lord's will. And the whole time, the Holy Spirit saying, why aren't we home? The place where you are is not where you're supposed to be. And it's a constant reminding voice on the inside of your heart that's saying, won't you come back? Because you're not, because at that point in time, we're not allowing Jesus to be the king of our heart. We're still the Lord of our own life. We're living, we're still trying to live in our own kingdom. We're not living inside of his kingdom. Do you realize that when you get saved, you move from one kingdom into another kingdom? I don't want to get a whole head of myself, but you move from one kingdom to another kingdom. There's a different will in the kingdom of God versus a, the will that's in the kingdom of the world. I believed at that time in my life that was most important was that I would seek after happiness and find fulfillment. Not realizing that once I got saved and received entrance into the kingdom of God, that there was a different standard and meaning to fulfillment and happiness because now God lived in me. And when I travel in a direction away from God, there's an uneasiness in my spirit. After salvation, the person who attempts to search for the feelings of happiness and fulfillment that the previous life offered in the new kingdom will be endlessly and aimlessly seeking and searching for temporary moments of pleasure and never really grasp what they're looking for because they will be looking for all the wrong things in all the wrong places. And you know, it, it, l listen, I just explained to you that it does, it's not always drugs and alcohol it's not always connected to addiction sometimes like I was trying to say earlier in my own life after I gave my heart to the Lord it was thinking that I'm living in Florida was going to fix it I remember I was even having a well I don't want to even get into that but the point is is that it's always something else no matter where I am there's something else that needs to be there in order to make me happy and the quickest way to say this is that there, this is a temporary time and these pleasures that we seek for that this time offers are only temporary in nature. And they're not going to keep you satisfied. The kingdom of God, on the other hand, is eternal and its rewards are also eternal. And the decisions made in the spirit, even in this life, have eternal consequences and rewards. I want to remind you real quickly about a story in the Old Testament. We're not going to go there for sake of time. But it's in Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse 29. And what the story says is, and Jacob sawed pottage. What does that mean? Jacob was cooking a, bowl, a, a, a pot of lentils. It's a form of a bean. And, and the idea, listen, I'm probably getting a little too deep here. But the idea is that the lentil in this case was red lentils. So the pottage was red. His brother, the Bible says that when he was born was red. His name was Esau. The people that were named after him were called Edom, which is a form of Adam, which means red. Adam was taken from the red earth, which was the red dirt. All this is, is a type of the flesh. And the flesh wants what it wants. It doesn't want to go God's way. It doesn't want to go according to the Spirit's way. It wants to go its way. And that's what my message this morning is, that the, that 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 that. that that home is where the heart is and that when the Holy Ghost lives in your heart and you're traveling outside of God's will and you're going in your own direction and you're running from the Lord, then the Holy Spirit is constantly reminding you that you're in the wrong place at the wrong time and that you need to get back home. And as long as you try to seek something else to fill that spot in your heart, you're going to continue to feel that uneasiness and feel as though you're not where you belong. So here's Jacob and he's cooking this pot of beans and his brother Esau, red and hairy, comes back from the forest. He's famished. The Bible says that he was faint. 
And, then, and he said, feed me, I beg you. Won't you feed me some of that red pottage that you have, for I am faint. And therefore was his name called Edom, a variant of Adam, meaning red, because he's of the flesh. And Jacob said, sell me this day your birthright. Jacob wasn't right either right now, but that's another story. Esau said, behold, I'm at the point to die. Right now, in this moment, this temporary vapor, I need pottage. I'm not worried about my future. I'm not worried about eternity. You got to give me something for my belly right now because I got to fix this thing that I'm missing. Jacob said, well, if you sell me your birthright, if you'll sell me your blessing in the future, I'll give you something right now. And so that's what he did. He sold his birthright. And Jacob gave him some pottage, and I'm just now noticing for the first time, he also gave him a little bit of bread. How sweet of Jacob. And he up, went up his way, and thus despised Esau, his birthright. See, Esau was the firstborn. Esau was where the lineage should have come of the Christ. But God knew in advance that Esau would despise the connection to Jesus. Just like God doesn't want us to despise that, but he knows about each and every one of our lives, and he knows how we're going to respond to the gospel. I hope you don't despise your birthright. I hope you don't despise your eternal inheritance. I hope you don't trade it in for some temporary moment of pleasure that you think is going to fill up the emptiness that's on the inside of your heart, when in reality, the thing that you search for is Jesus. Because I'm here to tell you, no money, no car, no house, no relationship, no child, no job, no business, no amount of money in your bank account is going to fill that spot that belongs to Jesus. There ain't no way. Let me tell you why. Because God is either real or he isn't. And if he is real, then he created you for a purpose. And you might not like his purpose. The scientists probably don't like his purpose. Because his purpose is so grand that the intellectual mind can't even perceive it. Because his purpose is, what will you do with the free will that I have given you? Will you choose me? Will you choose to serve me? Will you embrace my son? And will you let him be the king of your heart today so that you can be a co-heir tomorrow? See, you're not living for today, my friend. You're living for tomorrow. The decisions you make today will affect tomorrow. This is either true or it's not. And if it's true, then we should be living our life in such a way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But in the meantime, see, Esau was faint. The word means languid. It, it describes lacking in spirit or interest. He was listless. He was indifferent. He was thirsty. He was hungry for something else. And many times spiritually we're indifferent. Because we're thirsty for something else. He was indifferent towards eternity. He was indifferent towards his birthright because he had something else on his mind. Right, right. <laughs> That's what I, actually last night we had a meeting and I never heard anybody say this before, but we were talking, well, we were talking about this women's ministry that the Lord may develop in the future. And Angie was mentioning how she, how Naya's mama who ran this place in New Jersey, right? Yeah. And it was on 60 acres and the house was on a hill. And they were explaining all this. And then, and then Angie said when she got there, now I mean this is the picture perfect place to be. Angie's like, oh my God, I didn't know that the sky was this blue. Right. I didn't know the grass was this green. She said because, see, you don't ever look at any of that when you're just looking for the next. Now I never even heard nobody say it like that before, but my ears perked up. When you're looking for the, whatever the next is, it's not important what her next was. What was, whatever the next is, I told you in the story. For me, the next was turn to the back of the nursing journal to see if they got a job in Florida, thinking that now, even though I'm married and I got children and I got this good job and all this, that if I could just get a job in Florida on the white sandy beaches with the blue water, oh, I'm finally going to be happy. Whatever the next is, that's going to bring you. Happiness, But no, it's going to leave you empty because that's not what you were created for. That's not the purpose. And then once you're saved, oh, Lord, help you. Because if you're not saved and the Holy Spirit doesn't live in your heart, you might 
be able to get away with that thought. Oh, just give me the next. This is going to keep me happy. This is gonna... But if you're saved in the beginning, what did I say? You got a constant reminding voice in your heart reminding you that you are not home because you're dragging the Holy Ghost every which way and every direction and places that you ain't got no business being. And the Holy Spirit's trying to speak to you and say, you can try to numb it. You can try to quiet it. But I'm here to tell you, you're going in the wrong direction. And if you want to be in my will and you want some peace in the midst of your life, you're going to have to humble yourself and you're going to have to line up and bring your heart back where the home is. Mm. You know, we can pick on Esau, but sometimes it's really so hard to see God's will on this side of eternity. Amen. We're, we're in this temporal world and it seems so real. The things we see and touch and feel, they seem so real, but this is all going to pass away with time. It's all temporary. I was even thinking this morning about I was even thinking this morning about whenever, I don't know why, but when I read that about things that we see and touch and feel, I thought about when I lived in Singapore. And I can remember that for some reason we had silk fabric and stuff like that. I don't even remember what it was. Maybe clothes, I don't know. But I can re And then I can remember before that, my sister used to always have satin sheets. My sister Linda. She was all about her satin sheets, and I would. She didn't want me in her room, and I'd go sneak up in there because the satin felt good. I go. And she made such a big deal about it. I go sneak up in her room, and I get up under her covers, and I'd roll around up in them satin sheets. Well, I just kind of quickly this morning looked at. So I remember. I, I remember silk is expensive because you actually got to get it from a, the cocoon of a worm. So I mean, anything that you got to extract like that, right? Oh, look how you know. Oh, these special little. What's that stuff called? Truffles, these special little mushrooms that are, I think it's a mushroom, fungi that only grows in these little areas. And it's so like such a little bit of it that will give you a little pinch for a thousand dollars, you know, and it's like or, you know, silk fabric that has to be spun from from a cocoon of a worm somewhere. And it's like people think in their mind, oh, this is so nice. This is so grand. Nobody else can have this because it's so expensive. And look how it feels. It's so comfy and it makes you feel so good and all I'm trying to say is is that we get caught up in this temporal world and the things that it offers and the things that look good to our eyes and the things that that we believe or perceive to be good and we get caught up in that and that's really in the parable of the sower that the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches many times choke the life out but look let's look at real quick because we're talking about eternity versus temporary. Let's look real quick at a couple of these scriptures to remind ourselves what the Lord says about the world that we live on. Amen. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. This is what the Lord said. Now he's quoting out Isaiah. It says, all flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower thereof will fall away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to tell you something different than the world's going to tell you. Yeah, yeah. The world's going to tell you, trade in your eternity for this temporary moment of pleasure. Crawl up in these silken sheets. Grab a hold of your, you know, focus on your your nice BMW, whatever your car is. Focus on all of these things and trade it all in for what you're really intended to have. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, verse 35. says, As heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. First John chapter 2. I really wanted you to see this. I wasn't even planning on going to the whole thing, but as I began to look at some of the scriptures above it, I started off with 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. But then I felt like I needed to go up a little higher, and I saw why the Lord wanted me to do that. Let's look at verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. You got a desire. That word lust simply means a desire. So you have a desire for something that is going to please 
the please the external man. Make the external man happy, not the true spirit man that the Holy Spirit's connected to that's telling you that you're moving outside of God's will and also the lust of the eyes. All these things that you see that you have a desire and you're convinced are going to make you happy and fill the emptiness in your heart. The pride of life. I can still remember, and I'm sure she'll remember too, that I used to have a blue Toyota camera. And I know I've told you all the story. Hopefully you don't get tired of it. It's the best illustration I got. And I remember it all happened one year when I was actually in the doctor's office. And I was the Lord was already dealing with me about the commercialization of Christmas. And some guy said, hey, man, you ready for Christmas? And I can remember being so frustrated at that poor guy. I like I just came I came against the whole thing. I said, I'm so sick and tired of the commercialization of Christmas. I'm so sick and tired of people going into debt to outdo their their other family member. And they're trying to buy this. I said, I ain't buying no presents for nobody, no more. But my mom and my kids. And you know what? If ever, everybody else wants to try to give me a present, good for them. But they ain't getting a present back. I'm done with this. J God gave me a present. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross. They brought Jesus presence and we done got so caught up in all these presents that we we have forgotten what the meaning of this is that the hallelujah that God sent his only begotten son into the world to bring peace upon this earth to bring peace in your heart the pride of life is not of the father and anyway so what I'm talking about I'm talking about the pride of life so that's when it started in the room with this guy. And at the same time, I was bringing Isabella and Sierra to school. I had this blue Toyota Camry. And I had some missing hubcaps. I think they were both on one side, I think. <laughs> Probably on the right side where I'd have to drop the girls off at school. And one time, my doctor, my main doctor that's always been there to help me out financially, you know, was taking care of me, I mean, making sure I get my raises and stuff. One time he said, yeah, we don't pay the nurse practitioner enough to get hubcaps. <laughs> So I think it bothered him. And then one day I dropped him off and when I picked him up, Sierra said, uh, man, I can't remember what that boy, Gabe, Gage, something, yeah, I can't remember, something, Kissimmee or something. He said, man, your daddy's car, and they named it Buku Ratchet. <laughs> your daddy's car is Buku Ratchet. And I says, does that bother you? That, that, that he feels that way because it ain't like I can't buy no hubcaps. And it's not like I can't afford to get a better car. But I understand that if I go get a new car, within three months of me driving 80 miles every day, the depreciation of that car is going to plummet. And granted, maybe I could have gotten out of them every couple of years. But the point is, that's the way I was trying to think. And I was also trying to say, you know what? This works good for me because Matt's got an issue with the pride of life anyway. And so driving around Buku Ratchet without a couple of hubcaps does a good thing for me. It might not work for you, but it worked for me. She said, I don't really care, Daddy. I said, well, good then. I'm going to keep on driving Buku Ratchet. And I ain't even going to get no hubcaps because I can care less about them hubcaps. Caps. Pride of life. The idea that something else around the corner or on the horizon is going to make us happy. But look what it says. And the, and the world, the world passes away, verse 17, and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God will abide forever. We know that, right? I mean, because I was just talking about that. We know if you're saved, you know what I'm talking about. We know it that, that we're seeking after temporary things that are not ultimately going to bring us happiness and we believe it and yet we search and search. Like a wave tossed on the ocean, we keep looking for a shore to land on. All right, I'm going back to my message. The prodigal son, you ready? Point number one, I want to exercise my rights. Let's go back to Luke chapter 15, and we'll take a look at uh, verse number 12. Luke 15, verse number 12. It says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And it says, He divided unto them his living. Now I want you to see this. Now when he said he divided unto them his living, he's not saying I'm, a, I'm, I'm dividing this particular boy. No, he, the father 
divided his living or his portion that belonged to the son. So what I'm trying to talk to you about real quick here is that God created you with a free will. And God gave you everything that you needed in order to exist. And God is not going to try to control you to the point where he's going to tell you, no, you can't have this. And that's one of the hardest things as a parent that to get to the place whenever they start to grow up that you got to start releasing them and letting them go. He divided unto them his living. God gave you breath. God gave you hope. God gave you life. And he's also given you a free will that you can do what you want with it. Look at Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Joshua 24, verse 15. And it says, if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord. Now listen, you got to understand something. This is a time frame whenever the children of Israel are living in rebellion against God. They've intermixed themselves with the world. So this is still relevant for you today, Christian. Some people are like, oh, the Old Testament don't mean nothing. No, it means a lot. Yeah. See, because the Old Testament Israelites were doing the same thing then that Christianity does today. Old Testament Israelites were intermixing themselves with the world and they began to serve false gods. Christians today intermix themselves with the world and they're serving false gods. What you talking about, preacher? Uh, I ain't got no statue up in my You don't need a statue. You're filling yourself with all kinds of stuff that the world's offering you that has become an idol in your life and it's worse than a statue. It looms taller than a statue and it prevents you from being able to get to God. It prevents you from being able to see God because your eyes and your focus is so on these things that the world is offering. You. Right, right. So Joshua says, listen, it might not seem like the right thing to you, but you're going to you for you to serve the Lord. But you're going to make a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Make a decision. Either you're going to serve the gods that your father served on the other side of the flood. What's he talking about? All them false gods, pre-flood gods, fallen angels, demon spirits. Of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, hallelujah, we will serve the Lord. I can tell you right now, this preacher ain't perfect. But I have come to the place of revelation to understand that I want to serve God. I want to live my life for the Lord. I want to represent Him. I don't want to fall back into the way that I used to be. I don't want to serve all the old gods of the world that I used to serve. Because they ain't done nothing but destroy me and leave me more empty. And how much longer, how much more will it take for me to be convinced? Because that's really what my message is about this morning. What's it going to take to bring us to the place of convincing? Let me move on. So he took his, his portion. He said, give me my portion, Father. See, I see a perfect picture of God the Father, this Son, the believer. Give me my portion. It means my destiny. Give me my destiny and let me do with it, with my free will, what I will. See, but the choices affect destiny. Do we believe or not that God has a good plan for our lives? Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of good not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. See, God has a plan for your portion, for your destiny. But sometimes, but not sometimes, but the world also has a plan for your portion and your destiny. And if we're not careful, one day we'll wake up and realize we're not squandered at all. The choices that, if, that we make today affect us. See, his own decisions to take what his father had given him and move outside of God's will Result will result in loss to his life. The word substance. Because he spent it all. Substance means what one has, his property, his possessions. Listen to me. There's an, e there's an eternal inheritance in heaven that is waiting for us. But, it, but he wants to bless us even on this earth. But if we keep moving outside of God's will, what's going to happen at some point in time is we will end up squandering our substance. His wandering heart was unsatisfied at home with his father. And no one was going to be able to convince him otherwise. At this point in his life. You know, I remember Wednesday night, I said it probably five times. We need revelation from the Holy Spirit. We need yes. revelation from yes. the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please click the switch 
Somebody stand up. I remember I, I want to ask somebody to go over there and turn the switch off and click it back on. Because until the Holy Spirit flips the switch of revelation, I, the, the parent must tell the child, don't squander your life searching for all kinds of things that are only going to leave you empty. You need to understand that Jesus is the answer that you look for. And the, and the parent must continue to do that. And the preacher must continue to do that. Hallelujah. But I'm going to tell you something. Don't mention his mama in the story, but I guarantee you his daddy tried to talk to him. His mama tried to talk to him. I would imagine his close friends that loved him tried to say, dude, don't take your possessions and run off. It's not God's will for your life. But at that point in time in his life, ain't nobody going to convince him because he's like, I'm going to exercise my rights. God gave me a free will. I can make my own determination. He might be my savior, but he's not my king. Uh, he might have died on the cross for me, but he's not the Lord of my life. I got somebody else sitting on the throne, and I'm about to do wow. what I desire to do. His wandering heart was unsatisfied, and nobody was going to convince him. No one but the Holy Spirit will ever, ever be able to convince you. That what you're really looking for is already right here at home. Mm -hmm. That relationship with the Lord. Yes, Lord. That was point number one. I'm going to exercise my rights, buddy. You better move out of my way because I'm going. Listen, I'm learning, man. You can try to fight it in other people's lives. But I'm telling you right now, sometimes you just got to let people go. Yeah. And that's what this father did. He let him go. Mm -hmm. Point number two. Many times the road to convincing is painful. Listen. This word in my notes was supposed to be capitalized because it was, in my mind, a town, a destination, convincing. Where are you going? I'm going to convincing a place where I'm going to be convinced that what the word of the Lord said is true. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that the road on the way to that town, to that place, is much, is many times painful. Because there he wasted his substance when he had spent all. There was a famine in the land. Listen to me. Outside of God's will, famine will continue to seek you down and hunt you and follow you. And somebody might say, oh, no, preacher, my bank account is full. I ain't talking about your bank account, brother and sister. You have so much bank money flowing out and be spilling into everybody else. You still got a famine in your heart and emptiness for which you're seeking some type of happiness. But listen to me. Everywhere you turn, you will be left empty if you are running away from the will of God and you are going in your own direction. Yeah, and, you yeah. just keep falling further, too. That's where it says it. He will have fame to fill his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. He was feeding for pig food. Mm -hmm. You open up the door, it starts off not that bad, and the next thing you know, you right back where you, worst place that you could have ever imagined being. He was in want. It means to be destitute. Listen to this. This word tardy and fail. You ever remember whenever you failed at something? I can remember failing before. I don't know about you, but that bothered me. And listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not always the most prompt person, but when I'm tardy, dude, it bothers me. You know what I'm saying? I done showed up five minutes late. You might not think, well, if it bothers you so much, man, why don't you fix it? I don't know, but it bothers me. <laughs> Could you imagine being weighted down with a constant feeling of tardiness and failure? All oh, the enemy wants to destroy you with that. See, as long as the road feels fun, though, and seems fulfilling, we will stay on that journey. But when it comes to a dead end, and we start to realize that what we thought would bring us joy has again left us empty. Then repentance can come. Because you see, but repentance requires a change of mind and direction. So I'm on the road to convincing. I'm going to make it to this town. But then along the way, there's bumps on the highway. There's painful situations. And it's leading me further down a place I ought not go. And it's leaving me more and more empty and more and more painful. God knows how to help us change our minds, church. Yeah. God is the perfect example of fatherhood. He will allow us to travel the road of our choice knowing that he will be right there when we come to our senses. Mm -hmm. If we come to our senses, Lord, help us. Okay. A far country 
There he wasted his substance with riotous living. Verse 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he would have feigned or fiend to fill his belly with pig food. Look at this right here. And when he came to himself. I don't know about you, but I can remember being this guy right here. I can remember the darkest time of my life where I had no place to lay my head and didn't even know it, but my daddy was fine trying to find, he was trying to fix stuff. He was literally making all kinds of phone calls before they even had cell phones to people that knew me once that he might've had a connection to to find out where I was. And then when he found out where I was, he like was sending people like $100, $200 just to try to cover for me to be able to lay my head. And he would tell them, don't tell him that I sent you any money. But by the time the money got, got to the person where I had been sleeping, I was already sleeping in somebody else's house. Wow. He was trying to fix everything because, he, because I know that he loved me and he was carrying guilt and he felt like it was all his fault. But what I need to do is I got I to gotta come to myself. Yeah. I got to come to the place where the light switch flips on and it's between me and God. Yeah. I can't bring you to yourself. Right, right. Hallelujah. But the Lord knows how to put you on the road to the town called convincing to bring you to the place where you would come to yourself. It literally means that he was separated. The idea was, was that he was over here and his real person who would be a believer, who would be connected to Christ was over here. And finally, the Holy Spirit made him come to himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when he came to himself, he said, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. What am I doing? Lord. There's hired servants in my father's house that are doing all better than me. I will lower myself. Oh, hallelujah. See, pride ain't going to get it, church. Right, right, right. Uh, us being puffed up and arrogant and full of self and thinking we got something figured out and all this other stuff. Listen to me. It's so deep on the inside. Most of the time, whenever people ain't got nothing, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this or not. My dad used to say, you ain't got a pot to piss in, boy. Right, right. Well, the King James Version says they piss up against the wall. You ain't got a pot to piss in, son, and look at you. You're still over here rebelling. You're still over here. Or you ain't got nothing to your name and you still trying to go your way. What does it take to convince? And, and you know what I realized at that worst time in my life? I was so arrogant. Mm -hmm. I was so prideful. Right, right. I just, I actually thought that I had answers for people. Come on, come on. I'm like, oh, I'm going to fight you to the end, brother. Mm -hmm. Sister, I'll confront you. I'll tell and like look and they probably must have been looking at me like look at this fool. Right. Look at this fool right here. He got purple warm-ups with a torn shirt and paint on his clothes. His his tennis shoes are all I mean they might try to dress like that today on purpose. I don't know. But back then, look, I would look out and I thought I was cool. I wish I would have had a picture of that so that I could look backwards at that. I literally thought that I was cool in my own eyes. Lord, help me. I was destitute. I was in want. There was famine in the land. But thank you, Jesus, I finally got to a place with the help of the Holy Spirit. And other people had been trying to tell me where I came to myself. I came to myself. Lord, help us come to ourselves. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And this is what he said when he came to himself. He said, I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. I said it earlier because so many times the enemy will lie to us. And I wanted you to get this out of my message because I say a lot of words. And sometimes people say, oh, his messages seem harsh. But one thing that I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you this morning was. Is that his love for you will never die. Amen. And no matter how far you think you've moved away and no matter how bad you think you've done, I'm telling you right now, he is waiting with open arms to receive you back. Okay. And if you will go back to him, he will hug you. He will hold you. He will embrace you Amen. and he will throw a party for you. Amen. The angels in heaven will sing a song just for you because that's how much they love you. Movement towards humility changed the direction and started a journey towards a different destination. 
What he admitted first was that he had sinned against heaven. And that's really what's required. Right? right? You don't have to call me up and tell me your stuff. I mean, sometimes people feel like. I had somebody the other day that said, I just feel like I got with tears filled in their eyes. I feel like I got to. I just feel like I got to tell you something. I mean, you can tell me all day long. You can tell me. You can tell somebody else. You can tell that one. You can tell that one. But if you ain't. If you ain't really coming clean with the Lord, it might make you feel a little bit better for a moment of time. And I'm not opposed to that. I'll give you ears. I promise you I will. And I'll pray for you and I'll hug you and I'll tell you that I love you. But I can't fix it. And even though you tell me you might feel better for a moment in time, but the reality of it is, is that if you ain't coming clean and repenting and changing your direction with the Lord, this is going to be another time next week. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to give me a holler again in a month, two months. Yep. You get the point that I'm trying to make? Yep. No, whenever repentance takes place, there's a change of the mind and a change of direction. And with the help of the Lord. Yes. And that's yes. The, listen to me. With the help of the Lord, the revelation of the Holy Spirit, okay. with the Holy Spirit moving and operating in your life, the Holy Spirit doing the change on the inside reflected outwardly. Why? Because of what Jesus did. That's why the Holy Spirit can do it. Jesus already died on the cross to get rid of your sin, to allow the Holy Spirit to move in, to allow the Holy Spirit to do the work, not just for salvation, but every single day. As you keep your faith in Christ and his finished work, it gives the Holy Spirit permission to change you, to strengthen you, to encourage you, to walk towards the will of God to change your mind, to change your direction. Listen to me, you can't do this on your own. Right. This isn't an AA meeting. This isn't rehab. Right. This is recreation of a new creation yes. in Christ. Right. And I'm talking about the old has passed away. Right. Behold, all things become new. Jesus either did it or he didn't. He either said it is finished or he didn't. And the Holy Spirit either works through the finished work of Christ or he doesn't. And you need to add something to it. Lord, help us. And I got to work a program to get free. No, I need to bow my knee and surrender to the will of God. If that's you this morning, I want to pray for you.